Hello, and welcome to our WJE webinar. My name is Liz Pimper, and I'll be your moderator today. Our topic for this webinar is prepare your Chicago area building for compliance with the new OSHA rules. In November 2016, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration issued a final rule updating its general industry walking, working services standards specific to slip, trip, and fall hazards. The new rule governs a wide variety of conditions, including fixed bladders, low-slope roofs, and rope descent systems. The rule also includes a new section under the General Industry Personal Protective Equipment Standards that establishes employer requirements for using personal fall protection systems. Portions of the new rule became effective late last year. During the next hour, we will summarize and update you on the critical portions of the new rule and give an overview of facade access methods and equipment relevant code provisions governing facade access, and responsibilities of building owners and managers, especially as it pertains to buildings in Chicagoland. WJE facade access experts and structural engineers, John Lewis from WJE's Chicago office, and Kurt Holloway from our Northbrook office will explain OSHA's requirements, what actions you should take now, and provide more insight into what lies ahead. Now let's get started, and I'll turn it over to John Lewis. Well, thank you, Liz. Thanks everybody for joining us on behalf of Kurt Holloway. Uh, we're glad you're here. Hope to give you some food for thought over your lunch break today as we talk about this timely topic. Got a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Our primary goals today are to give you a general sense of what the OSHA requirements mandate for contractors and building owners relative to work that's performed at heights. We also wanna give you some effective ways to comply with those requirements, some of the specific learning objectives that we hope to cover today are shown on the slide here. A roadmap of where we're going, we'll start with somewhat of an executive summary on what's changed with respect to the OSHA requirements. After that, we'll cover specific regulations related to low slope roofs and facade access. And we'll finish with a wide ranging discussion on different paths that building owners can take towards complying with these new requirements. So what happened? On January 17, 2017, OSHA's final rule updating the general industry walking, working surfaces and fall protection standards took effect. It affects walking, working surfaces, which are basically any surfaces that are at height where a fall could occur. Those are basically horizontal surfaces. And then also facade access requirements for work that's performed on vertical surfaces on the exterior of your buildings. There were also some changes to fixed ladders, but we're going to focus primarily on the first two topics during our discussion today. I should point out that these changes affect work that's done in general industry and not construction. General industry is basically work that's done, uh, maintenance type work that is not, quali uh, that is not termed construction. Some of the requirements went into effect immediately on January 17th. Other ones have kind of delays in, in terms of when they become effective. On balance, there are more requirements that OSHA places on owners with, these, with this new final rule. So why did they do it? Well, first and foremost, OSHA's intent was to reduce injuries from falls occurring at heights greater than four feet. This is one of the leading, if not the leading cause of injuries or death in the workplace in the United States. They also wanted to better align the general industry practices with the construction standards. The general industry strand, standards dated to 1971, so they're pushing 50 years. Construction standards were a little bit more recent, and it's good just to have general compliance across uh, regulatory, uh, regulatory standards, depending on the type of work that you're doing. On a positive note, the new rule does allow a little bit more flexibility in compliance. There's more ways that a particular building can get in compliance with OSHA. It's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all approach. Now, kind of realizing that the existing rule had been in place in, since 1971 and that we're only uh, a few months into this new regime, the full impact of these changes is not yet clear. There's a lot of unknowns that are still out there. If your building is trying to figure out what's happened and, and what steps you need to take, you're not alone. There's quite a few other people that are trying to work through this, and there really hasn't been much guidance from OSHA other than the issuing of the rule itself. So it's a good reminder to check back to the OSHA website, which is shown at the bottom of the screen here, for updates on changes and in interpretations to the regulations. First topic we want to spend some time talking about are uh, the fall protection requirements for low slope roofs. So what do we mean when we say a low slope roof? 
doesn't have anything to do with the height of the roof, but rather the flatness of the roof itself. The new regulations that OSHA put out uh, apply to maintenance, not construction. Um, the previous regulations that existed prior to the rule were both harsh and vague, and that's a bad combination if you're trying to uh, stay in compliance with regulations. The alignment basically, uh, and the new, the new changes align the general industry provisions with the construction provisions in OSHA section 1910 or 1926. And that's where we divide the roof into different zones based upon exposure. OSHA basically realizes that the risk of falling increases as you get closer to the roof edge. There's three different zones that are established in the new regulation. We call them zones one, two, and three here, but OSHA does not, I should point out, OSHA does not necessarily call them zones one, two, and three, uh, but there are different regulations or requirements that apply in those different zones. Keep in mind too, there are narrow exceptions that exist for pre and post work inspections. For example, if you have a building maintenance worker who works in your engineering department and they're approaching an edge of the roof to verify that a gutter is not clogged after a rainstorm, fall protection may not be required for that activity. However, OSHA says that if fall protection is reasonably available at that location, then the worker has an obligation to use it no matter how short the task duration. Another example is uh, an insurance agent inspecting a roof edge for wind damage if evaluating a claim. If there's no fall protection provided on the roof, the agent can do a brief inspection without being in violation. But if there is fall protection available, like a restraint system, an anchorage, something like that, then the agent's obligated to use it. So let's take a look at how these regulations apply. We'll start with zone one. This is for work that's performed at a distance of at least 15 feet from the edge. In this area, you can always provide full fall protection. There's no reason to prevent an employer or a worker from going above and beyond the OSHA requirements. They are minimum requirements like most codes and standards. Um, you can also provide a warning line at the perimeter of this zone at 15 feet from the edge to let workers know that they're getting closer to the edge and should be using increased fall protection. However, OSHA does now say that there's no fall protection required if you're in this zone and the work is of an infrequent and temporary nature, as long as the employer has a rule that prohibits workers from encroaching upon the 15-foot perimeter. Infrequent work is not explicitly defined in OSHA, but examples that you can find in the rulemaking that explains how they arrived at this include tasks that are done on a monthly or annual basis. Temporary work is likewise described as short duration tasks, perhaps lasting only an hour or two. Examples of temporary and infrequent work might include replacing an HVAC filter, adjusting a satellite dish, uh, sealing a skylight joint, or unclogging a roof drain. Moving a little bit closer to the roof perimeter, if you're closer than 15 feet but um, greater than six feet from the edge, we're gonna call this zone two. Again, you can provide full fall protection for any activities that are performed in this area, or for temporary and infrequent work, you can use a designated area. This is a new, new requirement or new option that came on with the new rule. Designated area is basically a warning line system that lets workers know that they're getting closer than six feet, uh, closer than six feet from a roof edge. Now this can be used for temporary and infrequent work. It can't be used for tasks that are neither temporary nor infrequent. Full fall protection would be required if the work lasted longer than, say, a couple hours or if it was done with any sort of regularity. I should point out, too, that warning systems have their own requirements. They're not simply flagging a rope. If somebody's going to go the route of installing a warning line, the OSHA requirements for a compliant warning line should be reviewed. Zone three is probably a little bit easier, more straightforward. If you're closer than six feet from a roof edge, full fall protection is required. The logic there is that employees could trip or slip and get propelled over a roof edge. There are numerous systems that could be employed to provide full fall protection that are both passive, things like a guardrail, a parapet, a safety net, and active, which is a travel restraint or fall arrest system. Remember the previous the previously mentioned exceptions for pre and post work inspection can also be used, but if there are means for fall protection in this zone three, it must be used. 
So let's talk about a couple of examples that illustrate these new provisions in practice. Let's say that you've got an HVAC filter that needs to be replaced at the unit that's shown by the dashed red line. This is a temporary and infrequent task. It's more than 15 feet from a roof edge. If the employer enforces a rule that prohibits work closer than 15 feet from the edge, then no fall protection would be required for this task. If we do that same task, but do it in zone two in the yellow area, we're more than six feet from the edge, but less than 15 feet. This is still a temporary and frequent task, but now you would need to establish a warning line around the equipment and at least six feet from the roof edge because the risk of the work producing a fall has increased substantially by its proximity to the roof. Same activity, but if it's in zone three, less than six feet from the edge, in this case, you would need a guardrail, fall restraint, safety net, fall arrest, some other form of fall protection, no matter how short uh, the activity would be because you're in that zone three. In this example, let's say we have to do some longer term repairs to an HVAC unit, something that's gonna take more than a couple of hours or an hour or two. This is not temporary work. So in this case, you would need a warning line between the roof access point and the work area. Let's say there's a hatch at some point there in zone one. You would need to uh, put up a warning line that would kind of corral the workers as they were going to the spot where they needed to do the work. Same activity, longer term HVAC repairs, but in this case, let's put it in zone two. Not temporary work, so we need some sort of uh, fall protection around the unit. In this case, perhaps a guardrail at um, no closer than, or perhaps a guardrail around the unit, and then we also need a warning line that directs workers to that location so that they don't stray into an area where they could uh, expose themselves to a fall. Assimilating those examples all together, there's some buildings out there that have kind of looked at this on a uh, building-wide basis and said, hey, let's put in something that covers us no matter what we're going to do or covers us for, let's say, the vast majority of the activities that we're going to do. At the top and left and right sides of this roof, maybe there's not any equipment that requires access with any regularity, so maybe you get by with a warning line system there. But here at the bottom left and in the bottom right, there's equipment that is close proximity to the roof, so you can put up a guardrail so that anybody who goes onto the roof no matter what the activity, as long as it's performed in these areas, there's uh, OSHA compliant facade or OSHA compliant fall protection that's provided. Let's shift gears a little bit now and talk about facade access. So what do we need facade access for? We've gone from the roof of the building to the side of the building. So on your building, you probably have any number of these activities, cleaning, maintenance, inspection, and repairs. Probably the most common is, is window cleaning. Most buildings have their windows cleaned several times of the year. Some of you also have uh, maintenance that's performed with some regularity on your facade, sealant repairs, window reglazing. In some cases, more in-depth repairs are required, painting, masonry replacement, metal, metal repairs, and so forth. This last group of activities are commonly deemed construction activities by OSHA, and there are different requirements for activities deemed as maintenance and those deemed as construction. Also, the definition of construction is not well defined in OSHA, but generally speaking, anything beyond minimal maintenance qualifies construction and triggers additional and in some cases more stringent regulations. Let's now briefly review some common types of equipment. This photo shows a powered platform installation, which is sometimes referred to as a building maintenance unit or BMU. It has a roof car or carriage that traverses the roof perimeter, and, and the photo on the left, it's on a track, and the photo on the right, it's on a runway. Uh, the carriage raises and lowers a working platform that provides access to the work area on the facade. Platform is suspended by two independent sets of cables, and the workers are permitted to attach their personal fall protection directly to the platform. Another type of platform is this modular system, commonly referred to as a swing stage. In this case, the platform and the hoists are furnished by the contractor to access the building on a temporary basis. These systems are usually only supported by a single cable at each end of the platform, and thus the workers are required to have their personal fall protection equipment secured to independent lifelines that are in turn attached to a structurally sound anchorage point on the roof of the building. Contractors are responsible for inspecting and maintaining their platform and hoists, but the building is responsible for providing suitable points to suspend the platform as well as sufficient anchorage points to secure the lifelines and tiebacks. Davit systems are one way to support platforms, 
regardless of whether they are powered or non-powered, contractor provided or building provided. The components shown here include davit arms, which are indicated by the pink arrows. They extend up and out over the building edge to provide a suspension point. And the arms mate with davit bases, which are indicated by the yellow arrows that are connected to the roof framing and resolve the forces from the platform into the building structure. The platform, which is indicated by the red arrow, is raised and lowered by hoists, shown by the green arrow, that, tra that allows the, the platform to travel on the suspended cables. This photo shows a permanently dedicated movable outrigger. Functions similar to a davit system, but where a davit resolves the forces into a single point on the roof, an outrigger resolves the forces into two points, in this case, the inner and outer rail on this track. Requirements for building provided outriggers like the one shown here differ from those for contractor provided outriggers, which are significantly more common, at least here in Chicago. This webinar focuses on the requirements for permanently dedicated outriggers, not those provided by a contractor, because the requirements related to those fall on your contractor. Non-powered equipment such as rope descent systems or bosun's chairs are also fairly commonplace in the, Chicago, in the Chicago area and the United States as a whole. In this case, the platform, so to speak, is just a seat board upon which the worker rests. Rope descent systems require two lines, a descent or working line to support the platform and an independent vertical lifeline that will arrest and suspend a worker in the event of a fall. Industrial rope access techniques, or IRA, are similar to rope descent techniques, but there are some differences in the equipment and the training required. We'll talk a little bit more about those later. Rooftop anchorages are required to support independent lifelines for fall arrest equipment and to support equipment tiebacks for certain types of contractor provided equipment. Perhaps the most common are these individual standalone anchorages in the photo. They consist of a ring for securing the line, a post which extends down beneath the roof level to a base plate that is in turn secured to the roof framing. Spacings for these types of anchorages vary, but typically range from five to 10 feet, such that there are a sufficient number of anchorages easily accessible to workers. Keep in mind for these types of anchorages and any type of equipment on your roof, usually the most critical parts are concealed below your roofing membrane, so you can't see them. Horizontal lifelines are sometimes encountered on your buildings and can be used to connect lifelines, but typically not working lines. They're, they're complicated systems owing to the fact that the tension generated in the cable can be many, many times greater than the applied force, just like the tension in a clothesline in your backyard will far exceed the weight of the clothes it supports. Many horizontal lifeline systems are equipped with energy dissipating devices for this purpose that limits the forces transmitted to the roof structure. Permanently dedicated horizontal lifeline systems require engineering. They're also pretty complicated from a usage standpoint. The workers have to understand them and, and know how to attach to them so that they don't do anything wrong. Bottom line, they can be appropriate, but we should be wary of the challenges and limitations that they present. So now that we've completed a brief refresher on the types of equipment, let's talk a little bit about regulations and the hierarchy of standards that apply to facade access. For those of you keeping score at home, here's a roadmap to where some of the relevant OSHA requirements can be found in the Federal Register. OSHA doesn't make it easy to find these requirements. They're sprinkled throughout multiple sections, so a hunt and peck approach is usually required when trying to identify the relevant provisions for a particular building. The requirements for permanently dedicated powered equipment are found largely in Section 1910-66. There were some minor changes to this section in 2017, but for the most part, the requirements were substantially unchanged from before. If you have a BMU on your building, this is where the requirements for your monthly and annual inspections emanate from. If you have building provided davits or anchorages, then the provisions in this section apply to those things that your building owns, like the davits and anchorages. The contractor equipment is governed by section 1910.27. For contractor provided equipment, such as swing stages, parapet hooks, counterweighted outrigger beams, and so forth. The old section for this equipment has been completely eliminated and replaced with a new section that now essentially redirects to the construction provisions in 1926. The requirements have not really changed in a fundamental manner, but they're now a little bit more consistent with those that are used for construction activities. 
easily the topic we feel are the most questions about here in Chicago and around the country for that matter is the change to the provisions regarding rope descent systems. And they're twofold. One, there's a requirement that anchorages for rope descent systems be inspected, tested, and certified for 5,000 pounds by November 20th of this year. Second, the restriction on rope descent systems for use at heights over 300 feet is also a big change. I should point out that other locales, California for example, have had height limitations on the usage of rope descent systems in place for some time, and in some cases are more strict than the 300 foot limit adopted by OSHA. There are also new usage and training requirements for rope descent systems, but these apply mostly to contractors and workers and not building owners. So another topic that's come up quite a bit is industrial rope access. Some of you have probably heard about this, industrial rope access or IRA. It's very similar to, our, to rope descent systems, but there are notable differences between the two methods in terms of the equipment used and the level of training, with IRA systems being a little bit more intensive on both counts. For these and other reasons, OSHA distinguishes between IRA and RDS. They actually spend several pages in the rulemaking describing why IRA is different from RDS. And the regulations about the 300-foot limit and the anchorage certification that are applicable to RDS are not applicable to industrial rope access. IRA techniques may be particular germane, particularly germane for older buildings here in Chicago where providing suspended scaffolding is very tricky. IRA techniques may also be more expensive than rope descent systems given the additional training involved. As an aside, WJE staff utilize IRA techniques for our difficult access teamwork, which we've used on some of your buildings downtown for facade inspections. The photo here shows WJE professionals using IRA techniques several years ago to inspect the exterior of the Washington Monument. Beyond OSHA, there can be state level and local level provisions that govern facade access activities. For the most part, these local provisions supplement OSHA provisions. They cannot override them. Here in Chicago, there are two primary sections of the building code which affect or are relevant to facade, to facade access activities. Section 1334 was enacted after the Hancock collapse in 2002. Many of the logistical requirements and permitting requirements, operational requirements are contained in Section 1334, but these apply mainly for contractors. However, that section does reference two guide standards, uh, American Society of Mechanical Engineers A120 and ANSI A10.8, which both have relevant provisions for owners and contractors. Section 1831 contains provisions for powered window washing platforms of a permanent type. Essentially, your building maintenance units are BMUs. Most of the provisions in Section 1831 mimic similar provisions found in the OSHA regulations, and they're primarily related to the design of the equipment and not so much the operation. Some of you who do have BMUs on your roof are probably aware the city has started a mandate that powered platforms be inspected by the elevator inspector on an annual basis, similar to your passenger and freight elevators. Again, this is only for permanently dedicated powered platforms. Chicago also has an exposed metal structure ordinance that some of you may be familiar with that requires all exterior metal structures to be inspected at five-year intervals. This would include any exposed components of your facade access equipment, such as a roof track, davit bases, and ded dedicated anchorages, for example. For those of you with facilities in the suburbs, it is rare but not unheard of for municipalities to enact provisions related to facade access. Some of the model codes, such as the International Building Code, or IBC, and ASC 7 now contain design requirements for structural elements supporting facade access equipment. These model codes also contain provisions relevant to load testing, but these mainly affect your design professionals who you have evaluate and certify your equipment. Now we're a caution about a standard you may have heard referenced rel relative to facade access. The International Window Cleaning Association I-14.1 standard was created with a worthy goal to improve safety surrounding window washing activities. I think we can all agree that's a good thing. However, the technical provisions of this document were flawed in many ways, and to say that the standard has had a checkered past would be a gross understatement. 
Its accreditation was permanently withdrawn by ANSI in late 2016, although it may continue to be referenced by some local codes and by some companies and our vendors. WJE's opinion is that this standard should not be cited or relied upon. There are more reputable and technically sound documents that can be cited instead. Another standard that should be viewed with caution is the ASME A120.1 standard. Many of the same people who developed the IWCA standard were also involved in developing key provisions in the A120 standard. Its provisions on load testing are egregiously wrong and should not be followed by engineers. Kurt will cover this topic in a, in a little bit more detail later. We should note that the 2001 version of ASME A120 is referenced by the Chicago Building Code and is thus applicable in Chicago. However, its provisions should not and cannot supersede the requirements of other standards that govern this equipment. So, to summarize what's been transpiring in our fair city over the past few months, there's still a lot of questions out there, and many of them are speculative to some degree because there are no reports of OSHA enforcement as of yet. For example, does an OSHA inspector know how to distinguish between rope descent systems and industrial rope access techniques? We're not sure. There also are no published interpretations on OSHA's website, although we expect that will change with time because there are quite a few questions and we, we would suppose that people will be posing those questions to OSHA for clarification. If you're trying to figure out how these regulations impact your billing, you're not alone. Many buildings are struggling to evaluate their options, identify the equipment they have, and determine if they're in compliance or not. Some equipment manufacturers are doing quick inspections and selling building new anchorage installations, which may be premature based on the equipment that they have out there. It's also a little bit of a frenzy this time of year with summer construction in full swing too. So what what we've seen at WJE so far to be most effective is to try to have a collaborative discussion with your vendors, with your architect engineer, uh, and, and with yourself about what you have on your building, what you've been doing, what options you have for compliance with the new regulations. Certainly this isn't a situation where a one-size-fits-all approach is best. We've been adding these discussions into our visits with you for other routine City of Chicago inspections for the facade ordinance, exposed metal structures, and so forth. That's a great time to get up on the roof, talk with you, talk with your, your contractors about these changes and where you stand relative to compliance. So with that, I think I've teed it up pretty well for Kurt to talk a little bit about how you can get in compliance. Thanks, John, and thanks again to everybody for attending our webinar today. I want to talk about some strategies that we can look at, look towards to try to see if we are compliant or, or bring ourselves back into compliance or reach compliance for the first time. But this question itself, are we compliant, uh, is a little bit daunting. Hopefully by now you're already identifying areas where your operations may be affected by the new OSHA rules and action is needed to reach or remain in compliance. But how do we tackle this thing? There's so many changes, so many topics. Where do we start? First, I'd like to briefly touch on two misconceptions about OSHA compliance and highlight an op appropriate conceptual framework for addressing safety and risk on our rooftops and facades. We need to dispense with the notion that OSHA compliance will automatically make you quote unquote safe. OSHA compliance is the minimum legal requirement and other local rules may be more stringent. It doesn't address every building or every situation and won't by itself result in a safe workplace. A concept used throughout safety engineering that's helpful to view the topic at hand is the hierarchy of controls. Um, in, in short, the hierarchy of controls recognizes that not all compliant protection provides the same level of safety. Every fall protection system or strategy, short of completely eliminating the hazard, possesses some degree of residual risk. For example, a guardrail, a passive type of fall protection system, doesn't require the worker to do anything once it's in place. It's less defeatable and actually prevents a fall from occurring. An active fall arrest system relies heavily on the worker to properly use the PPE equipment and anchorage to be effective and still will allow the fall to occur, requiring prompt rescue and having a higher residual risk of injury even when everything goes right. 
Remember, OSHA requires quote-unquote prompt rescue to avoid worker suspension trauma, which is essentially when someone's in a harness and the, the cords are binding up on their legs, they can have circulatory or other uh, medical issues that come even if the fall is successfully arrested. Remember, there are a wide range of compliant fall protection options available to you to a lesser degree with respect to facade access, but still options available, each with their own trade-offs. Selection of appropriate and compliant facade access or fall protection systems should acknowledge the needs and operations of your organization. All work at heights possesses some level of remaining risk. The risks are yours. The question is, how will you manage them? We also need to dispense with the notion that compliance is equal to good risk management. What we've things that are we think are helpful uh, steps to consider as you're trying to manage your risk is to assess your hazards and your work tasks. Where is that greatest risk? Prioritize compliance and safety spending in terms of the dollars you have available where they'll do the most good. And address first things first. Some helpful questions to ask yourself from an operational standpoint as you're trying to prioritize things are, what work do we need to do up there and where? How often? What am I willing to pay for compliance? Are aesthetics important on my building? How will fall protection affect other building systems? For example, the roof, if we're gonna put a net bunch of penetrations through it for new anchorages. And what will permanent dedicated systems cost me operationally? In terms of testing and certification, which are kind of upfront costs, but also in terms of recurring costs, like training, maintenance, inspection requirements for given types of fall protection or facade access equipment. Now, with those concepts in place and that mindset, are we compliant? Let's return to the question and focus on first things first, the key dates for implementation of the new rule. Some of these things are already in effect, as John alluded to earlier. The 300-foot prohibition of rope descent usage and a majority of the new fall protection rules went into effect in early January when things were rolled out. We've also passed the May 17th deadline for uh, training of employees that are exposed to fall arrest uh, systems and using those. And then we have some other key dates coming up on November 20th for rope descent system anchorage certification. Further down the field, there are some uh, trigger dates for uh, ladders in excess of 24 feet. But again, those are not the primary subject of our talk today. More fundamentally, you need to ask yourself, what will we need to change in our maintenance operations this year, and what about the longer term? To make an action plan, first begin by assessing your hazards, operations, and risk. OSHA requires this assessment anyways. In Section 1910.132D, they require employers to assess fall and falling object hazards. Once you've identified noncompliances and hazards, how your work tasks and operations interface with these, you can prioritize your actions to address areas of greatest risk first. Knowledge is definitely power on your side in this case. As far as training specifically, Section 191030 details the requirements of the training that was due as of May 17th. For workers exposed to falls at heights and using personal fall protection systems. OSHA wasn't tremendously specific about what documentation is required, but that it should be documented. Just because you've missed the deadline, quote unquote, it's better to get in compliance now. It's important to point out that OSHA is a reactionary and enforcement agency. They're not proactively going around checking training punch cards, so to speak. This issue is most likely to come up as a violation if something happens at your building or if another citation is issued and training is not documented. At WJE, our own professionals are exposed to falls and uh, risk work at heights on a frequent basis, and so all of our own folks have to go through fall protection training. And among site-specific trainings for particular buildings or jobs we're working on, we train our own staff with a series of in-house webinars and in-person training on fall protection-related issues. A similar strategy is likely accessible and um, implementable for you as well. Specifically looking at facade act or at low slope roof fall protection, I uh, want to remind you of the options that are available. Um, 
They should be selected based on your operational preferences, the work task frequency and duration, and the distance that those work tasks are being done from roof edges. Remind yourselves that you have permanent options available, but also temporary solutions that may cover the majority of your tasks. And those can be passive systems like guardrail that you put up and, and other than a coat of paint every once in a while, it's good for decades, or it may be as intensive as anchorages where you're annually required to inspect and certify those. Um, for temporary solutions, guardrail is also a possibility in that uh, collapsible, collapsible or temporary systems are available. And then as John mentioned earlier, warning lines and administrative controls may also be good choices depending on your situation. Looking to rope descent systems and facade access, Clearly, buildings over 300 feet above ground need a new solution. That's out. That's prohibited now. Um, for anchorages for rope descent systems, a qualified person must be the one to identify, test, and certify that these things have the 5,000 pound capacity required in 1910 section 27. This has to be done by November 20th of this year. So that date is looming in uh, in, in front of us. And then every 10 years thereafter, that certification needs to be reestablished with annual inspections by a qualified person between. It's important to point out that OSHA insisted that building owners have skin in the game here and that similar to other power platform permanent installations, they are the ones that must provide the certification documentation to the accessing contractors before use. And in summary, the days of self-selection of any kind of anchorage of any piece of structure on the roof that a worker deems appropriate for their own anchorage is gone. Uh, that's no longer permitted. These things have to be dedicated and certified. Moving to suspended scaffolds, uh, if we're thinking of davit systems, these for a long time under 191066 have been required to be sort of tested and certified and annually inspected. Uh, there have only been minor changes to 191966, uh, and most of those are just sort of references that have been adjusted to accommodate the other changes in the OSHA standards. It's important to point out that once these things have been load tested or, or certified, there's no explicit requirement for retesting of this equipment except if it's been damaged or if it's been modified in some way. Same thing is true of anchorages for tiebacks of con contractor supplied suspension equipment. But in general, if they're dedicated and they're on a roof, they do need to be tested as part of the facade access installation. Would like to point out that personal fall arrest system anchorages, there is no, if they are used only for that purpose under section 1910-140, there is no explicit requirement for load testing or certification of fall arrest anchorages. However, for most, the most part, if you see an anchorage up on a roof, an anchorage can be used one day for rope descent, the next day for suspended scaffold tieback, and the next day for fall arrest. And so it's wise to use the most stringent provisions governing each class of equipment that, that you have on your roof, unless you have very tight control over the usage of that equipment. Now, I'd like to dig into some clarifications about what testing a facade access equipment should look like, what OSHA requires, and some of the common pitfalls to avoid when pursuing certification of this stuff. Chief among these are some poor practices that are still widely used in the industry that on the surface still bear that certified stamp of approval, but in reality may significantly undermine the value and accuracy of the testing. Load testing to the full required capacity is logical and likely required by governing structural building codes. However, ASME A120 and the window cleaning I14 standards both limit test loads to half of the minimum required strength. Reasons are provided justifying this. We don't want to damage the roofing. Oh, we don't want to damage the equipment. Well, WJE believes, along with many other reputable structural engineering firms, that the lives of workers are more important than potential damage to the roofing or even damage to the facade access equipment if it's not performing as it's legally required to do so. And we would much rather have the equipment be damaged or fail during a controlled load test than when the anchorages or davits are being used to support workers and subjected to an emergency overload. Here's a little logic puzzle to just step through the crux of this matter. 
Imagine you're on a hike with two friends through a jungle and you come across this raging torrent chasm that certain death will happen if you fall off this bridge or the bridge fails and you're crossing it. But you've got to get across this thing to get home. Hiker number one weighs 200 pounds. Hiker number two weighs 100 pounds and you weigh 180 pounds. Say the 200 pound hiker crosses the bridge on the left successfully. Yay. And the hiker number two that weighs 100 pounds crosses the bridge on the right and also crosses successfully. Which bridge are you going to cross? Personally, I think I'm going to cross the bridge on the left that I know successfully held the weight of a heavier person than I am. That's my best chance of getting home. Why would we do anything different when we're testing uh, facade access equipment and it's required to carry a certain capacity by law? We also need to be cognizant of the test loads and directions when we're trying to certify these systems. The testing apparatus and, and program needs to simulate as closely as possible the way the loads will actually be, actually be applied in service. Testing a davit base or an anchorage in one direction doesn't automatically mean that the, the system is structurally sound for the load in any direction. It's okay in a testing program to define and restrict the directions in which the equipment may be used based on the test results. If testing in multiple directions is not feasible, is not needed, or is not cost effective. What's shown here in the slide is an example map of a, of a testing program that was executed on a building where at the building corners, the davit bases and anchorages could conceivably use, be used to, on scaffold drops on more than one side of the building, and so they were loaded at 90 degrees to each other to facilitate this. An example of a load test here that's being performed that doesn't necessarily provide a good simulation of the test loads. Here we see some anchorages near a roof edge that presumably are going to be loaded toward the roof edge if they're used for fall arrest systems or if they're used to tie back temporary scaffold uh, supports. However, in this case, the load test is applying the load parallel to the edge of the roof. Sure, it's simpler and easier to test two anchorages against each other, and in this way you can accomplish two tests at one time, and you have another anchorage nearby to react up. It's very handy. However, that test does not demonstrate the required capacity in the direction of use. For this reason, we would not consider this to be a valid load test. While OSHA simply requires testing and certification to be compliant, <laughs> It's imperative that testing be done in the proper manner, as evidenced by numerous test failures observe, of equipment observed by WJE over the years. We don't make this stuff up. There are known instances of failures of equipment, and so we have to insist that this stuff is done appropriately. I would challenge you with the question, how valuable is a letter of certification based on an improper test? To, to, flush this out a little bit more. Here's an example of some davit arms that we tested from a Chicago skyscraper that were brought to our Northbrook laboratory for testing. Uh, you can see on the photo on the left, the arm sort of reaches up gently uh, up to the left. Uh, as load was applied, the arm began to deflect and went south of horizontal at approximately 2,200 pounds, which all this thing was able to hold, which was a far cry from the 4,500 pounds that it was required to carry for the hoist rating that it was supposed to have. And you can see on the photo on the right at that load, we're starting to get buckling, local buckling and yielding of the, the curve of that pipe. The fact is some of the equipment is just under designed or it's older or hidden deterioration may be present on certain elements of, of building equipment. And these things are real and they can occur. Observe this test in progress of a database at the upper right that rig is there. Pop, the thing just it essentially exploded. It sounded like a gunshot when I was there uh, witnessing the test of a davit base. Uh, a sudden brittle fracture of the welds uh, occurred at the load uh, between the half load it was required to carry and the full load it was re required to carry. About 80-85% of the load it was required to carry is when that fractured. Um, at that building we saw a different kind of defect in place in that there was widespread um, insufficient weld and in, in low quality welding done that was concealed beneath the roof uh, dating to the original construction. And so we just started popping these things uh, and some of them were able to hold the full required load and others were not. 
Um, some were grossly deformed, like the one on the right, and the davit arm that would be leaning off of this base would be uh, sort of leaning uncomfortably far over the building edge and magnifying the loads that might be applied to it. When we get the opportunity to see uh, failures like this, we, we strongly advise our clients that we investigate and understand the causes for this. In this case, you can see in the photo on the right, the weld is just kind of sitting there on top of the davit base um, and not welding it down to the top flange of the structure below. Uh, in some cases, um, weld was missing or weld was not fused right. And you can see in a map of how the anchorage is performed or the davit base is performed on the building, uh, we lost a good number of them during the testing program. What's Remarkable is that at this building, testing was actually performed previously to the half load. And some of the anchorages were flagged as not performing well, but a number of them were, were giving passing grades, so to speak, um, because they were only asked to do half of what they were really required to do. And that half load was less than the maximum foreseeable stall load of a, of a hoist, a, a service load. So what we get also from this is that some of the corner anchorages, we had them pass in one direction and then fail when the load was rotated 90 degrees and applied the other way, brittly and, and dramatically in some instances. What this case study underscores is the need to test to the full OSHA required loads. It underscores the importance of load direction and it underscores the need to test each and every installation and component, not just the sampling. Again, I challenge you with the question, is your certification worth the paper it's printed on? Compliance isn't a checkbox, and safety isn't a certificate. Behind any meaningful certification, be a college diploma, a fitness certification, uh, any kind of thing that we certify in life, it's a document that stands for the substance behind uh, the requirements that, that are being met in full and rigorously vetted. What are those requirements for uh, facade access equipment? They're the capacity requirements of OSHA, the load testing provisions of the building code, and reference structural engineering standards. That simple. A few comments on uh, load testing and certification done the right way. Uh, as a building owner, the reports that are generated by your engineer or your testing agency are your written certification and your written assurance that are required by OSHA that you give to the contractor that your equipment meets the standards. What do you expect them to contain? Do you expect a one-page letter that simply says, yep, we tested them and they all look good? Or do you expect a detailed report that describes the test, test methods, the loads and procedures used, the limitations of the data and the results? Um, and the results for each test or just a, a blanket statement that says, yes, they should all be good for the load. Um, in Illinois, further, we'd comment that a licensed structural engineer should be the only one performing these services and that um, the Illinois Structural Engineering Practice Act, Act limits these services to those of a licensed SE. Uh, and further, when we're doing testing, we, we need to be recording the deflection, the movement of the system, and, and it, usually our engineer is on site to observe uh, and make sure things are performing as they should be. Uh, some comments when we need to add um, equipment to buildings or if your system needs to be supplemented or you need new anchorages, turnkey anchorages can be a great way to go. And by turnkey, we mean where typically one provider, one vendor is designing, fabricating, installing, testing, certifying, and perhaps inspecting these things uh, annually afterwards. Um, in many situations, this is prevalent in the industry and can be a great way to go when you don't already have anchorages available. However, we'd caution you to, to beware. Many of the turnkey providers are equipment manufacturers that have a vested interest in sort of selling equipment. Um, and they often, whether they intend to or not, tend to view uh, solutions through that lens. Uh, remember, anchorages are often just one option for your building, at least with respect to new anchorages. Often, uh, some of these providers are ones that are doing half load testing. Uh, and also, you want to be aware of any kind of equipment solution or turnkey solution that doesn't meet your, meet your operational needs and objectives. Uh, often, turnkey providers will approach a building or uh, a problem with a sort of a canned solution. And you've got to ask yourself, does my solution fit in a can? There may be many valid paths to compliance but don't automatically assume the first one offered is the best one for your facility or operations. 
If you look at the Chicago skyline and many of the buildings we've worked on and that you represent as our audience today, there are not a lot of canned buildings in Chicago. There are a lot of unique skins on the facade, unique access needs, unique maintenance needs, unique geometries. And these things all might need a little bit of different solution uh, in terms of how we're accessing these on our operational basis. Touching on some of the classes of buildings in Chicago that we're getting the most uh, requests for help on, uh, certainly the buildings under 300 feet that are older uh, are still eligible for rope descent and been using it for decades, uh, using bolts and chairs, but they predate the original OSHA regulations from the 70s or before, and they don't have anything dedicated on their roof. Um, these are, we're getting lots of requests for help with these, whether they be new anchorages or finding some other means of, of getting compliant access. And it might look like this building, or this one, or this one, or this one, and they're just popping up all over the city, these requests for help. Uh, a good portion of the building stock in Chicago is in this class of older buildings under 300 feet wanting to use rope descent systems and now hit with this regulation saying, hey, we need to provide compliant uh, certified anchorages for the first time ever. Another class of buildings are the 300 foot plus club uh, where rope, rope descent is now prohibited. Uh, this photo is taken downtown at a height of about 300 feet on a building rooftop, and that orange line is approximately representing a 300-foot threshold. And what you'll notice is that in Chicago, 300 feet doesn't buy you a whole lot of real estate. Um, a high percentage of downtown buildings are affected by the 300-foot rule. Uh, depending on floor-to-floor -floor height, that's meaning you're probably 20 or 30 stories and anything above that. In this class of building, often the older buildings are affected, but some new buildings as well. If the original access system for the building, whether that be dedicated outriggers, a davit system, or building maintenance unit, no, is no longer operational, uh, a lot of times these buildings have previously limped along with rope descent system usage for window cleaning and light maintenance work, and have occasionally used temporary suspended scaffold access, um, tying to whatever structure is available until OSHA outlawed RDS, and now it's harder to get along, and folks are starting to look at these things again. Uh, the rope, de rope descent system ban has also called attention to some laps or uncertified uh, equipment that may be existing on these taller buildings that just for lack of inspection or lack of documented testing or one thing or another, um, they don't have uh, certified powered platform equipment. And so in many cases, we're recertifying existing systems or we're augmenting or supplementing or adapting and reusing existing framing uh, to provide access in a new compliant way. If your anchorages or your davit arms or your system doesn't pass a load test or your certification has lapsed, it's not the end of the story and you don't have to start over. Uh, a qualified person can help you troubleshoot your problems. They can work objectively with you to identify the best fall, fall protection and facade access approaches for your facility and can provide a lot of ability to design, modify, repair, or recertify systems as needed. There are many ways for it. You know your own operational budgets and your appetite for uh, risk and how you would like to manage risk at your organization. The legal requirements are what they are, but managing your risk is up to you. We would just strongly encourage you that before signing yourself up for $100,000 or $200,000 of new anchorages, have a qualified person assist you in evaluating your options. With that, we appreciate your attention and would like to open this up for discussion and questions. And thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Kurt. As a reminder, if you have a question, please just type it into the Q&A box and hit send. And if we don't get to your question during the call, we will follow up with everyone afterward. So let's go ahead and take our first question. Is the 300-foot criteria based on the foundation of the building or the street level? But this is John, I think that it's pretty clear in OSHA that that 300 foot criteria is based on adjacent grade. Um, it wouldn't go below grade. Likewise, if you have a building that's 600 feet tall, or let's say 500 feet tall, and you have a lower roof that's 300 feet tall, and then the height of that upper drop is only 200 feet, 
well, OSHA would still consider that a violation if you used RDS because the 500 feet top of the building is greater than 300. It has more to do with atmospheric conditions than it does with height over a lower roof. But the the baseline criteria is from, from adjacent grade. Okay, uh, we've received several questions on the Anchorage inspection and testing requirements. Can either of you please clarify these requirements? Yeah, it is pretty complicated. Kurt touched on it uh, a little bit. The load testing requirements are not laid out in a particularly logical manner. Following the letter of the law, the only anchorages that are required to be tested are those that are used for rope descent systems. And you can almost pause for a minute and let's let the irrationality of that wash over you for a second. Basically, it's saying that you can have an anchorage that's used to tie back a half-ton outrigger beam that supports a platform with three people on it, and no load testing would be required for that. Um, but you would have to do load testing if it's used to support somebody who's on an RDS system. Now, fortunately, most buildings, vendors, and engineers have concluded that all anchorages should be tested or certified regardless of the use because and we don't particularly value the life of someone on a bosun's chair more or less than someone on a swing stage. I mean, the, the testing should be fairly uniform. Um, in brief, the, the requirements are you should have your equipment tested prior to being placed into service, in particular if it's going to be used for rope descent systems because that's the letter of the law. Um, they should be inspected annually, and then they need to be recertified with or without testing, it's not entirely clear yet based on the new regulation. The new regulations worded kind of weird, but you need to have that recertification done every 10 years. So initial testing, annual inspections, and then recertification at, at 10 year intervals. Okay, so there have also been a few questions about older buildings with wood framed roofs. What strategies can these buildings implement? Sure. Um, Older buildings with wood frame roofs are not uh, prohibitively uh, unable to, to receive rooftop anchorages if anchorages are the right solution. Um, we have some known, uh, I believe, case studies at WJE where anchorages for wood roofs and wood framing have been designed. Um, they typically require a little bit more attention to the structural detailing of those to avoid inducing concentrated forces in excess of what the existing structure can handle. Um, and this is an instance where a turnkey provider that might be accustomed to providing a certain type of anchorage off the shelf, so to speak, might shy away from digging into uh, a project with a, with a lightweight structure, so to speak, like a wood timber framed roof, but a qualified person can design some custom anchorages and detail them in a way such that a fabricator or a contractor can make them and install them and they can perform successfully. So. Um, there are some challenges, but there should not be a, a prohibitive view of, of a wood structure receiving dedicated anchorages. Can RDS be used over 300 feet if the contractor deems it the safest way to access the facade? It can, um, but the, the level of effort that would be required to make a convincing and compelling argument to OSHA, who would have the final vote there, is not yet known. Uh, it seems like, based on similar situations in other parts of the regulation, where they say something like, you can do this, but only if the facade cannot be accessed safely by another means, they set a pretty high bar. So kind of what an owner or a contractor might say is, um, cannot be accessed by any other means, OSHA might take a different opinion. If it's just that it's cost prohibitive or that it's uh, difficult, that may not be convincing to OSHA. So the short answer is yes, it's possible, but be prepared to have a pretty long, tough slog to justify that if you do get cited by OSHA for a violation. Okay, what is the difference between the one-year inspection and the 10-year inspection that takes place? And how often do we need to recertify? 
Sure. Uh, these questions that we get all the time, uh, typically for rope descent systems, uh, those anchorages requ are required to be annually inspected. All powered platform installations, which could be anchorages for tiebacks or davit systems or outriggers or building maintenance units uh, that are powered platform supporting equipment, those have to be annually inspected as well in OSHA. Uh, but only rope descent systems have this uh, verbatim requirement that there be a recertification at a 10-year interval. In Section 1910.66, there, like John said, there is only the requirement that they be tested or certified, so to speak, before they're placed into service initially, or if they are modified or damaged in some way, they would need to be retested or recertified. So there's a distinction between rope descent and powered platforms, but everything that's dedicated up on your roofs needs to be annually inspected. Is there a reason that 1926 doesn't have distance from the edge requirements like 1910's six foot and 15 foot? What happens if rooftop work goes from being 1910 to 1926? That's a good question. I, I have to say I'm not entirely sure. Um, I can give kind of a, a an overall answer in that the 1910 provisions are, are newer. They've just come out, so there's a little bit more definition to those. The 1910 provisions are for general industry too, which is viewed as kind of a more common occurrence than, than is construction. So generally speaking, some of those requirements get spelled out in a little bit more detail, and they can be a little bit more stringent. Um, if you're having work that goes from being maintenance to uh, construction, I guess in a general sense, the answer should be whoever your responsible person is or um, supervisor should evaluate those activities and try to determine what the appropriate regulations are. But if there's a question about the activity all of a sudden changing on a dime from being general maintenance to construction, I don't think, I'm trying to think of an example where that could could be, uh, again, keeping in mind that 1910, which is general industry, is mainly maintenance type work, and 1926 would be, say, something like roof work or um, building an extension on your roof, which has obviously a lot more work or effort involved. So not sure if there's a, a short, pithy answer there, but um, in a broad sense, the 1910 provisions are newer. They expand a little bit more on the 1926 provisions again, realizing that there's more risk when you're closer to an edge. All right, thank you, John, and thank you, Kurt. That's all the time we have for questions right now. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today, and we hope that it's been educational. As a reminder, following the presentation, presentation in the next day or so, we will send you a link to a brief survey and also instructions on how to obtain credit for participating in today's webinar. We will also send you a link to a recording of this webinar that you can pass on to others in your organization or colleagues who you think may be interested. Again, we appreciate your time and we hope you have a great afternoon.